Hello class, welcome to our third lecture from chapter 9, which is all about lipids and biological membranes. This third lecture is the last set of this chapter, and it is all about membrane structure and assembly. So we're going to talk a little bit about the fluid, fluid mosaic model of membrane structure, as well as the secretory pathway and vesicle transport and fusion that are all about getting proteins where they need to go. So let's first start by discussing the fluid mosaic model. And what is the fluid mosaic model? So essentially, the fluid mosaic model describes the motion that we see in a lipid bilayer. You can imagine it as though the lipid bilayer is a sea of lipids, and there are proteins almost floating in it like icebergs. These proteins are able to diffuse laterally, uh, freely, from side to side, as we've discussed earlier when we were talking about movement in lipid bilayers. Um, the occasionally, in some membranes, proteins can be constrained on the membrane, but unless they are constrained, they're able to diffuse. And uh, we have a number of different lab techniques, most of them involving fluorescence, that can help us to demonstrate this mobility, this property of membrane proteins that we see for this fluid mosaic model. So let's talk about one of those fluorescence techniques. So the one that we're going to be discussing first is called fluorescence recovery after photo bleaching, or FRAP. So during FRAP, um, we start with a cell. Um, the cell has been, as you can see in this picture, um, labeled with this green fluorescent marker. Um, when we come in using a laser, we bleach out some of this fluorescent marker, and we make this, this bleach spot that you can see here, so in sort of beige or background color. Um, but over time, because you have free diffusion of all the proteins and the lipids in this bilayer, we have what you call recovery, where uh, proteins that are still green from elsewhere in the cell are able to move into this area, and some of the bleached out proteins are able to diffuse away from the bleached area. So ultimately, over time, the cell that, that bleached dot um, will eventually recover back to its normal green appearance. And we can see that in part C using a graph looking at fluorescence intensity over time. So we start with a whatever high normal level of green color of fluorescence intensity. Then we come in with that laser that bleaches out that one specific area and the fluorescence intensity goes down in that area. And then over time we see that recovery where other green fluorescent marked proteins move in and the bleached ones move out. So let's look at that in a video. The lateral mobility of membrane proteins can be measured in living cells by FRAP, which stands for fluorescence recovery after photo bleaching. For this purpose, membrane proteins are often expressed as fusion proteins with the green fluorescent protein GMP and observed with the fluorescence microscope. A selected area of the cell is then bleached with a strong computer controlled fluid replacement model. Those membrane proteins that are not anchored and therefore can diffuse the plane of the membrane quickly exchange places with their neighbors and fill back in with each surface. From the right of this fluorescent the diffusion cuts from the protein. It binds tightly to the meshwork of the nuclear cell. After photo bleaching, no fluorescence recovery can be seen over the same time frame. All right, so this was a good example of what we might see um, for both 
still going back to our original picture. So that was a really good example of both this bleaching and recovery that we first discussed in the first part of that video. And then the second part showed us in contrast what happens when you have a constrained protein that's unable to diffuse laterally. Um, and so that video had a very good example of those two particular conditions. So let's move on to thinking about some other methods we can use to observe this lateral movement of proteins in a cell membrane. So this experiment is using fluorescence microscopy, which is kind of fun because you can see the changes as you go. And so, um, so we start out with two different cells. One is a mouse cell and one is a human cell. The mouse cell is labeled in green, which you can see here, and the human cell is labeled in red. And you can see that same color scheme in these fluorescence micrographs. Um, at this point, the mouse cells and human cells are all in a dish together. And you, um, in the lab, we add or they added a Sendai virus, um, which helps these two cells to fuse together to form what we call a hybrid cell, because it's part mouse and part human. So right after this fusion caused by the virus, you have one big cell. Um, but you can see that the proteins are segregated. The green mouse proteins are still on the mouse side, which you can see over here. The red human proteins are still on the other side, which you can see in this picture over here. And so, um, but if you leave that cell alone for about 40 minutes at 37 degrees Celsius, um, then we can start to observe this lateral movement, this free diffusion of both the green and the red surface proteins. They are not constrained. They're able to move freely around the cell. And so at that point, they fully intermix back with each other. And we can see that in this cartoon diagram, as well as in these fluorescence micrograph pictures. So the green proteins, when we first fused the cells together in this step over here, they were segregated just on the one hemisphere of the cell. And the last step, they have fully um, diffused around the whole cell. And the same, we see the same thing for those red proteins. So that's another another method we can use that doesn't involve bleaching, but still involves fluorescence to to observe the movement of the free diffusion of proteins on the lateral surface of a cell. So now that we've thought about all of these proteins that are on the surface of a cell, um, it's probably important to think about how they got there. So these next couple slides are going to be all about um, the trafficking. Of, and the synthesis and trafficking of proteins that are both membrane bound and also secreted outside of the cell. So any proteins that are who, that are that have a, a destiny or a fate to either live on the surface of the cell or to be secreted from the cell, like we see here, um, have a very particular pathway during their synthesis. So um, as we should know, um, all proteins have to be translated by ribosomes. So for all proteins, whether their destiny is to live in the cytoplasm forever or if their destiny is to eventually be secreted or sent to the membrane, all proteins start their translation by a ribosome, a free ribosome that's in the cytoplasm. Um, but for, for proteins who are going to be membrane or secreted proteins, they have a particular sequence called a signal sequence. And when that sequence starts to get translated, that is a clue for the ribosome to start moving over to the rough ER, which we can see over here in this diagram. So we have this rough ER that's dotted with these little gray dots that are all ribosomes. All of these ribosomes are busy translating proteins that ultimately are going to get placed in the cell membrane or secreted outside of the cell. And so, um, so the, the ribosome docks itself on the outside of the rough ER and it translates the protein right into the inside of the rough ER, to the lumen of the rough ER. And we can see that all these little red spots, that's what these are. These are little proteins that were translated by ribosomes directly into the lumen of the rough endoplasmic reticulum. And in the rough endoplasmic reticulum, like we talked about earlier, this is where some co-translational modifications are started. For example, our N-glycosylation. <coughs> Excuse me. So, so while the protein is still being translated by the ribosome into the ER, inside the ER there are other enzymes that are starting to attach particular um, modifications that we see. And editing also begins in the rough ER. But eventually to finish um, editing and getting the protein ready for its final form, it has to get sent from the ER to the Golgi. 
And to do that, um, the cell uses what are called vesicles, which are small little membrane-bound spheres that can contain um, any kind of cargo. It's often, but not always, proteins. It can be other, other things. Mm -hmm. And so if the protein is destined to be secreted, it will start to bud off into little vesicles like we see here, either inside the vesicle, in the lumen of that vesicle, or on the actual membrane of the vesicle. So a protein, if it's going to be an integral membrane protein, um, it, as it's getting translated, it gets translated right into the membrane of the rough ER, and that itself is then butted off to make this vesicle, which eventually then gets sent to the Golgi, where the vesicle can then fuse with the Golgi apparatus. And that's where more post-translational modifications are going to occur, or you can have further editing of modifications that started co-translationally. And then, so these membrane and secreted proteins are gonna travel through the Golgi from the cis cisterny to the medial cisterny to the trans cisterny. And every time it moves to a different little compartment of the Golgi, it has to get packaged up in a vesicle and sent down the line. And then eventually when the protein is in its final form, it's been trimmed and modified and it's all ready to go, it then gets sent out into another vesicle, which we call now a secretory vesicle, where it gets sent to the surface of the cell, which we see here. And so this secretory vesicle can then fuse with the plasma membrane. And that will send all of the contents, the cargo inside this vesicle, out of the cell in the case of secreted proteins or in the case of proteins that are part already in the actual membrane of the vesicle, they will just then fuse with the plasma membrane and live out their lives as integral membrane proteins. So, um, that, so that was just talking about proteins, um, synthesis and trafficking of secreted and membrane proteins. Um, and now it's also an important type to consider lipid synthesis and trafficking, since after all this chapter is all about lipids. And so, <clears throat> so lipids are also synthesized in the ER, but um, while the rough ER we talked about is for proteins, the lipids are synthesized in the smooth ER, and they're synthesized on the cytoplasmic face, so the face of the smooth ER that faces out into the cytoplasm. And then from there, we have a sort of similar trafficking pattern as we saw with the proteins. So once lipids are synthesized, they are then transported in vesicles to the Golgi, where they're further processed, and they travel through the different compartments of the Golgi, and eventually they're sent to the target membrane, whether that's the cell membrane um, or the membrane of another organelle within that cell. <clears throat> so, um, so this brings us to a good question of how do the vesicles know where to go? If we have vesicles that are sending cargo all over different organelles of the cell, as well as to different, as well as to the outside of the cell, it's very important that the right vesicle with the right cargo ends up in the right location. And so, this um, next part is going to be more about how we can differentiate between different vesicles that are going to different locations. <coughs> and so, so when we're thinking about this, it's important to consider um, that as vesicles are being formed, this, this budding off of the vesicle to make a little tiny compartment container um, is mediated by what we call protein coats. And there are different types of protein coats that form depending on the vesicle's origin, location, as well as its destination. So the first protein coat that we'll talk about is called the COP2 coat. Um, and this sort of coat helps to form vesicles that are traveling from the ER to the Golgi. And again, this is a normal part of our secretory pathway for secreted or membrane proteins, right? Remember, those proteins are getting translated in the ER. They're starting to get modified in the ER. And then they have to get sent to the Golgi to finish up the processing before they eventually get to the cell membrane. We also have another type of protein coat called the COP1 coat. The COP1 coat is for sending vesicles within the Golgi apparatus, so from one Golgi compartment to another Golgi compartment. Um, and the COP1 coat is also actually used for um, sending back any resident ER proteins from the Golgi to the ER. So, um, so we talked about how for a lot of proteins, they get post-translationally modified in the Golgi apparatus. Um, but some proteins, their their fate, their destiny is to live out their life in the ER. So these proteins would have to get translated and um, have co-translational modifications begin in the ER 
these proteins would then get sent to the Golgi to finish with post-translational modifications, and then they would have to get sent backwards in this pathway back to the ER. These are ER resident proteins. And so to do that backwards motion, you'd have this COP1 protein coat that forms on those vesicles. So to summarize so far, if we're traveling from the ER to the Golgi, we have COP2 proteins. If we're traveling originating in the Golgi, we have COP1 proteins. And then a third important type of protein coat that we're going to consider is called the clathrin coat. So the clathrin coated vesicles are formed <coughs> for, excuse me, vesicles that are um, originating in the Golgi and ending up at the plasma membrane and also sort of in the reverse. So vesicles formed by endocytosis, meaning when the cell is taking up um, cargo from the outside of the cell. It's going to pinch off a vesicle at the plasma membrane using a clathrin coat to form that endocytic vesicle. And you can see the clathrin coat, or you can see all of the different types of coats. There's electron micrographs of all of them. These are these fuzzy uh, gray, grayscale kind of pictures. Um, the COP1 and the COP2 coats honestly look pretty similar, um, but you can see pretty distinctly there's these protein coats that are up uh, on the surface of this very clear vesicle. Let's do the same thing over here. You have the protein coat on the surface of the vesicle. Uh, the clathrin coat is a little bit different. The clathrin coat is more highly structured, um, which you can see very clearly in the electron micrograph. Um, it almost looks a little bit like a soccer ball because of those little hexagon-shaped proteins. So now that we talked about how these vesicles are formed and how we get the cargo inside of them, um, it's important to think about the sort of last part, which is once the vesicle reaches its final destination, how does it release its contents? How does it know it got to its destination membrane? And how does it fuse with the membrane to then release the secreted proteins or the membrane proteins? So, um, yeah, so this is mediated through a set of proteins that are called snares. And so... Yeah, so the title of the slide is saying exocytosis is mediated by snares. This would, exocytosis is when you have a secretory vesicle that's filled with a cargo that has some kind of cargo that needs to be secreted outside of the cell. Um, and snares are a type of protein that helped with that vesicle fusion, like I said. So um, the fusion of the vesicle with the target membrane has two main functions. So the first one is the one I was just mentioning, which is releasing of the vesicle content, such as secreted proteins, or in the example we're going to talk about here, neurotransmitters, into the extracellular space. Um, and it's also for inserting lipids and integral membrane proteins into that new destination membrane. So both of these are really important functions for the cell to have to get all of the components of the cell into the right location so they can do their job. So we're going to consider, as an example here, these neurotransmitters. Um, so we have this picture on the right. We're looking at, a, at neurons, right? So neurons talk to each other by sending neurotransmitters from the presynaptic cell, which we see on top, um, to the postsynaptic cell, which we see on the bottom. And so you have, in the presynaptic cell, there are synaptic vesicles. They're filled with neurotransmitters. Um, and that's in the presynaptic cell. And then um, a lot of times those vesicles are just waiting by the presynaptic membrane until they get a signal. And then once they receive that signal, that's what tells the vesicle to then fuse with the presynaptic membrane and lets them release their contents. And then those neurotransmitters are finally able to give a signal to the postsynaptic membrane, which we see down here. So how does that work? Like we said, it is mediated by snares. So let's look at that more carefully. So snares are either integral or lipid-linked proteins. Um, in this picture, you can sort of see we have two different types of snares, R-snares and Q-snares. So the R-snares are shown here in blue. Um, they're called R-snares because they um, have arginine in them. And, um, and we see the R-snares in the vesicle membrane. And so we can see particularly the R-snare protein, it extends all the way into that membrane. So it's a little tether that extends out of the membrane of the vesicle. The Q-snare, similar but different, so similar function, similar structure, but its location is now in the target membrane. And Q-snares are called Q-snares because they contain glutamine. So the one-letter code for glutamine is Q, the one-letter code for arginine is R. So we have R and Q-snares. And once these snares come close together, um, they start to interact with each other in ways that help to pull the membrane of the vesicle and the target membrane even closer to each other.
and then ultimately when they get too close or close enough, they will fuse with one another. Um, and this is, we can call this process the zipping. So we can see the R snare and the Q snare in this middle picture. They've started to interact with each other and they sort of twist together. And each time they start to twist, they pull the vesicle closer to the target membrane. And ultimately, it becomes energetically favorable to fuse the vesicle with the target membrane. Um, a lot of this is because you can imagine you have a lot of water in this space that's outside of the lipid bilayers. Um, and if they get squeezed together too tightly, it's more energetically favorable to start to exclude that water um, and form just one big happy lipid bilayer um, and have all the aqueous stuff elsewhere. So with that, now you should be ready to answer the chapter nine membrane structure and assembly practice questions.